Welcome to the EU Green Deal Masterclass, live from Circle, Amsterdam. Uh, this broadcast is brought to you from the Circular Pavilion in front of the headquarters of ABN Amro Bank. Um, and the objective today is to make you an expert in two hours on the EU Green Deal that was proposed by the European Commission about six weeks ago. Um, in several chapters, we'll go through the EU Green Deal in an easy to, to digest manner. Uh, and uh, the, the promise is also that you get a comprehensive understanding of the plans, why it is all proposed at once, and how it is intertwined, where we're coming from as well, and why this is proposed as, uh, as it is. Uh, of course, in just two hours, I can't be complete. It's 12,000 pages of proposals. There is a lot in there, a lot of detail, a lot of um, maybe other policy measures that, that I cannot cover, but I will, you will get a comprehensive overview of the entire package. Um, this masterclass of two hours will be in English, it will be recorded and it will be available on YouTube probably tomorrow. Um, the Dutch version of this uh, masterclass, so this is relevant for native Dutch uh, people, uh, is already on YouTube. I gave it a few weeks ago, uh, so if you go to the Circle, canal, uh, Circle channel on YouTube, Circle NL, C-I-R-C-L-N-L, you can already find a playlist there with the full masterclass in Dutch. This, was, is, uh, this one is in English. Um, if you have, again, I, can't be, I cannot be com fully complete, but if you have any questions already right now or during the masterclass, feel free to ask them in the chat. I have a tablet right here in front of me. Um, if you ask questions, they'll come in uh, right here. And after each chapter, uh, there is a live Q&A where I try to answer all of these questions. Um, and also afterwards, if you have other questions or follow up, feel free to contact me on uh, LinkedIn and, uh, and connect and uh, I will happily help you out. Um, my name is Arnold Mulder, um, my, I'm sector banker energy at ABN AMRO or sector expert uh, energy, uh, you could say. Um, at ABN AMRO we try to accelerate the energy transition through financing and all our other banking services, but today by giving you a better understanding of what is out there and coming at us with speed, because the EU Green Deal is really going to change the business as usual for all sectors in our economy, in our European economy. Um, so let's start right away. Um, where are we? If we're talking EU Green Deal, we're talking energy transition. And if we're talking energy transition, we're talking climate change. And if we're talking climate change, the reference point is always 1990, because that's the level of emissions that any reduction target is benchmarked from, basically. So uh, in 1990, emissions were at about 5 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. So that's not just CO2, but also other greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it all adds up to about 5 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. And as you see in the graph, um, we had a 2020 target of minus 20% um, compared to that 1990 benchmark point. And even without COVID, we were basically, we achieved that target and we were, we were, we were, we were you know, doing well compared to that target. But it's not the end goal. The end goal for Europe is to become the first um, um, net zero continent in the world by 2050. And to do that, we also have a, a reduction target for 2030. And currently that target is set at minus 40%. As you see in the graph, based on the green and the, the yellow line, we're uh, not yet in line with that target, but still the European Commission, Europe, has already agreed that that target should be um, uh, set at a more stringent level, simply to be on a path towards net zero by 2050 and be in line with our commitment to the Paris Agreement. So what the Green Deal is about is not about the target. The target has already been agreed to by all company, uh, companies, countries in, in Europe. The Green Deal is really about the gap between where we expect to be in 2030 and where we want to be. So the green arrows in this graph that I added to this graph. 
a bit on the status of the Green Deal. Uh, you may have also heard the term fit for 55. Obviously, the new target is minus 55%, so that's why this package of proposals is also termed fit for 55, but most commonly it's called the EU Green Deal. Um, these terms are used interchangeably. We're basically talking about the same thing. What is the status of this legislative um, pack? Well, um, it has now been proposed by the European Commission that you see here at the top. Um, and the way legislation works in Europe, there are uh, three governing bodies. Uh, the, the European Commission proposes legislation, but the European Commission and the Council of the European U Union, they adopt legislation. So it's not binding legislation yet. We're actually now starting with negotiations. They are starting with negotiations, maybe I should say. The Council of the European Union, you could maybe loosely see as some sort of uh, uh, the European Senate. Uh, there is a council for uh, the, the heads of all, um, the government heads of all uh, member states, but also councils, councils on ministerial levels. Uh, and together with the European Parliament, they'll have to agree on a final package that may be passed into binding legislation. How long this negotiation is going to last I don't know. It could take years, it could take less than years, um, but uh, it will probably take some time. It is important to note, however, that we're talking about 2030 here, right? A package of proposals to achieve the target for 2030. That's nine years down the road. That also means that if negotiations are going to take up three years, that's already you know, a lot of time lost that we can't spend on actually implementing and actually executing the plan. So it's critical that negotiations, in my view, are kept as short as possible. Okay, so, so what is actually in those proposals? Is it one pack of paper? No, it's actually multiple um, uh, 15 pieces of legislation, you could say. And if the European Commission proposes a piece of legislation, it's typically either a regulation, a directive, or a decision. What are these three types of legislation? Well, a regulation is a binding legislative act, and it must be applied in its entirety across the EU. It's probably the most binding type of legislation that can come from Europe. Then there are also directives. And directives set also a binding target, but there is some room to play for individual member states to decide the, ex uh, the, the precise route to that target. And then finally, there are decisions, and decisions have a narrower scope, for example, on a uh, specific country, specific sector or subsector, or a speci specific company even. So if you look at these 15 proposals, what are they? Well, we're talking about eight regulations, six directives, and one decision, but the decision is basically an amendment of a directive. So I count it as a directive uh, to keep things completely simple. Um, not all of these proposals are completely new. There are actually four regulations that are brand new and maybe groundbreaking, you could say. The others are either a, an amendment on existing regulation, so there is already a directive or a regulation, but it is amended, or a complete recast of an existing regulation or directive. But four of them are brand new. Okay, so, we, so now we know there are several regulations, there are several directives. What type of regulations do we have? And again, the regulation is a binding legislative act applicable across the EU. There is limited uh, freedom for individual member states to, to set a course there. First of all, stricter binding annual greenhouse gas reduction targets for member states. Stricter performance standards for new passenger cars and light commercial vehicles. Stricter rules regarding land use, forestry and agriculture. An updated alternative fuels infrastructure law or laws. The carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is basically a border, CO2 border tax around Europe. Um, at the Social Climate Fund, as you see, the green stars are back. These are the brand, brand new regulations that are proposed. A proposal to boost the production and uptake of sustainable aviation fuels and a proposal to, to um, use renewable and low carbon fuels in the maritime industry. Good. Long list. What, are the, what kind, type of directives are proposed? Well, a full update on the taxation for energy products and electricity. 
stricter rules for the EU emission trading scheme that has already been in place since 2005, but it is strongly amended, and also the market stability reserve, which is a part, a mech, uh, an element of the ETS. Then there is a separate directive on, again, on that market stability reserve. So this also relates to tightening up the existing ETS for, for heavy industry. An amendment regarding offsetting for aircraft operators. I'll, I'll uh, come to that early in this uh, masterclass. And, um, and, and a directive on the aviation's contribution to reduction targets um, and implementing global market-based measure. More ambitious renewable energy targets and a full update. So this is not just uh, uh, some amendments, but the full recast, uh, full uh, new, <laughs> new rewritten energy efficiency directive, also more, much more stringent. So now we know what is in these proposals, what types of regulations and directives it, it, it uh, covers. Um, so based on that, I made the following masterclass overview. So these are the chapters we're gonna go by um, one by one. And after each chapter, there's Q&A possibility. Um, the first one is, well, a very clear one, the targets for CO2 reduction. And where I say CO2 reduction, I obviously mean greenhouse gas reduction, but for simplicity here, uh, CO2 equivalent uh, reduction. We cover, a, this will take a, approximately 14 minutes, but all the, it depends as well on how many questions come in. So this is just rough estimates here. Um, second chapter is on targets for renewable energy, about taking about seven minutes. Uh, energy efficiency, 14 minutes. Taxation and CO2 pricing is chapter four, and it is actually, it breaks down in several sub chapters because taxation and CO2 pricing, so actually pricing in the cost of CO2 uh, is a big chunk of, uh, of this complete set of uh, proposals. Chapter 4.1, the first sub, sub chapter of four is taxation on, on fuels. So fuel, fuel taxes, basically, not, this is not CO2 pricing yet. After that, we have a 10 minute break. You can walk around a bit, uh, uh, take a refreshment, uh, and uh, in 10 minutes, we go back to the masterclass for the second part, where we cover the CO2 border tax or officially termed CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. Very, very important part of this overall proposal. CO2 pricing in the maritime industry. Tough industry, tough sector to abate, um, uh, but um, big plans to also introduce CO2 pricing there. Also CO2 pricing in the built environment, transport sector, and so the social climate fund that is attached to those proposals. I'll come to the details obviously, in time. Chapter five will cover cars and light commercial vehicles. Alternative fuels infrastructure will be chapter six. Very critical because we have a single European market and you actually want to be able to easily go from one end to the other end of this economic zone. So the fuels infrastructure is critical for that. And land use, forestry and agriculture, finally, short chapter, five minutes, and that brings us, would bring us uh, to the end of the masterclass, uh, where you can call yourself an EU Green Deal expert. So, um, before I go to the first chapter, let's see if some questions came, came in. Um, is the, the emissions of the EU should include the emissions associated with imports, otherwise we are only externalizing our emissions to poorer countries while making us look greener. Is there any initiative in that regard? Um, yeah, well, the, 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 uh, the regulation is mostly on, uh, on you know, uh, um, uh, direct emissions from plants and companies, but the CO2 border tax will uh, 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 strongly deal with the way we, um, the way we deal with imports and exports and also the competitive position, uh, basically being able to actually strongly reduce CO2 emissions without losing the economic activity, without losing the jobs, the technological development and all the knowledge. So uh, that is critical there. Obviously supply chain impacts very important there, but maybe uh, any questions on that, I would uh, suggest after uh, chapter 4.2. 
um, why year 1919 has been taken as a starting point? Well, you have to start somewhere. Uh, and in the 90s, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the efforts to reduce emissions really uh, kick-started. So that was, uh, at that point, chosen. Could have also probably been a different year, but uh, that was the benchmark, and it, it, it still is. Um, what is the main reason the targets are so hard to hit and things are moving so slowly? Is, that we don't, is it that we don't have enough technology or is it because big companies and their shareholders are resistant to change? Um, maybe both. Because um, a lot of technology that we need, um, and we'll cover uh, a, f a few technologies, um, it, it is still in development, it still needs to scale up. We saw it also with wind energy, solar energy, huge scale up over the last few years. It was not on the shelf available in the 90s and even uh, the early years of this century. So it's, it definitely has to do with technological development, R&D. For companies and governments to commit that, to that, the EU Green Deal will, will definitely help. And for investors, I, I'm certain that this will help to close the, the valley of death, so to say. So the time between investing in a technology now and actually expecting a market to be there to buy your products. So if that... Um, value of death becomes smaller, investors will be much more willing to make these steps towards scale up of critical technology that we need. Is it because companies are resistant to change? Well, a lot of companies are resistant to change if it means that they will have to close factories or close down or, um, well, go broke, basically. So and I think there are, this also again relates to the CO2 border tax. That's why it's so pivotal. Um, uh, the competitive position of companies is also part of, uh, you know, they have to be able to continue operations. Because um, the least sustainable uh, company is a sustainable uh, is a company that goes broke, uh, right? So there are a lot of elements in here that will actually help to overcome if if it if these obstacles exist to overcome these obstacles. So technological technological scale up and learning and maybe some resistance because companies um, well they don't don't know certain enough what is ahead, so they can't invest on it. How seriously do politicians in the Netherlands debate approve 100% transition to renewable energy? Um, how seriously do they debate it? Um, well, we don't have a 100% renewable energy, an official 100% uh, renewable energy target yet in the Netherlands. We'll, we will come to the targets for renewable energy in uh, chapter two. So maybe that is also a good question to dive deeper on uh, after that or in that chapter. Um, what does the regulation mandate for electro electrical mechanical products? Um, what? Okay, I don't exactly understand the question. It's a very specific one for electrical mechanical products. Um, maybe afterwards we can uh, uh, connect me on LinkedIn, ask a question, and I'll, 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 come, I'll come right back to you. Um, where does the chemical strategy for sustainability fit uh, in this overview? The chemical strategy for sustainability, that is also quite a broad um, a term. Happy to discuss this further. Again, uh, let me know and uh, we'll continue the conversation and I hope I can give you a more specific answer also what you're looking for. Thank you.